West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. You know, on this show, we've been highlighting a disturbing new trend on the right where Republicans and their allies play footsie with fringe conspiracy theorists by attempting to smear Democrats as sympathetic to child abuse. It's a dog whistle to QAnon supporters who believe that the Democratic Party is made up of a Satan worshiping cabal of pedophiles who run a child sex trafficking ring. That is their belief. Now, not to be undone, outdone, last night, Republican star Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia, who has her finger on the pulse of the Republican base as well as anyone, took the rhetoric a step further, doing away with any pretense and just explicitly calling her political opponents pedophiles. The Democrats are the party of pedophiles. The Democrats are the party of princess predators from Disney. The Democrats are the party of, of teachers, uh, elementary school teachers trying to trying to transition their elementary school age children and convince them they're a different gender. This is the party of, of their identity and their identity is the most disgusting, evil, horrible things happening in our country. And that's why we have to say it. Now, Green may be the most extreme Republicans in terms of that rhetoric, her willingness to invoke QAnon, but she is far from the only one pushing that exact line of attack. In fact, it's become mainstream. It was the entire basis of the Republican smears against Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, soon to be the first black woman to sit on the Supreme Court in this nation's history, with the vote for her confirmation coming as early as tomorrow. One of the prolific smear peddlers was Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee. I do want to go back to the the issue about the child predators. Do you believe child predators are misunderstood? So is it your position that child pornography offenders are not pedophiles? Do you believe that it matters to the children and their parents who suffer abuse what motivation those abusers had. I want to make certain that we protect children and that we continue to do our best effort to protect children. I also want to make certain that we're going to have judges on the federal bench and justices that are going to protect those rights of children. Again, the context here is clear, right? That's just like, I don't know, a few degrees more subtle than Marjorie Taylor Greene, but they're doing the same thing. Now, if Senator Blackburn is acting in good faith, which seems doubtful to me, but if she's concerned about, as I keep saying, the very, very real issue of child sexual abuse, then it's odd that she doesn't at least appear publicly to be using her power to do anything about a very disturbing situation that's been happening in her home state house. State representatives in Tennessee have been working on a bill known as HB 233. Now, that's obviously a Republican-dominated legislature. 
And it's basically an anti-gay marriage bill. It would allow the state to make an additional marriage category only eligible to opposite sex couples who do not want to be part of the same institution that allows gay people to tie the knot. Now, that's bigoted and bad on its own, right? And and it's an indication, and this should be very clear, of just how much right-wing forces right now are gathering themselves and champing at the bit to roll back marriage equality. That is coming. But that's not even the worst part of that particular piece of legislation. The House version of the bill, as it was introduced, didn't include an age minimum. Yeah, it, it, it means it could pave the way to legalize child marriage, like child brides. Again, I'm not making this up. I I, I thought this was not true when I first read the story, but just listen to the sponsor of the bill, Republican State Representative Tom Leatherwood. All this bill does is give an alternative form of marriage for those pastors and other individuals who have a conscientious objection to the current pathway to marriage. Is there no age limit in this bill? Well, again, with my understanding, you know, I think it would be um, 18 is the way this would be construed. Um, So, yeah, I'll ask a question, but I just want to make clear just what the testimony is. There's no age on it? Okay, well, my dad would be my... I just want to make sure there wasn't an explicit age limit. My concern... No, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't understand your question. No, there is not an explicit um, age limit. I've watched that several times today. What, what exactly are you up to here, Leatherwood? Like, you know there's, no ex- there's an explicit age limit in the law at the time, as the uh, other representative notes, but there's no explicit age limit here. Now, the other man you heard talking there is Democrat Mike Stewart. He called the bill, quote, a get out of jail free card for people who are basically committing statutory rape. Again, sounds bad to me. Also, why? What? Again, just to be clear, this is not an abstract concern. There are people out there with fringe religious beliefs who might take advantage of such a loophole in the law. For example, there's the story, somewhat infamous, of Warren Jeffs, a religious fanatic, president of the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, not to be confused with the regular Mormon church. He's a polygamist accused of having 78 wives, dozens of whom were underage. Back in 2007, Jeffs was charged, was convicted on charges of facilitating the marriage of a 14-year-old to her 19-year-old cousin. Again, that sounds disgusting and wrong to me. Now, that alone is pretty horrifying, but wouldn't you know it, Tucker Carlson, one of the most vocal champions of the Democrats are soft on child abuse spears, didn't see it that way, didn't think it was a big deal. In fact, back in 2009, he went out of his way to defend Jeffs. Well, actually, he's not in prison for that. He didn't warn Jeff didn't marry underage girls. No, he, he's, in, he's in prison for facilitation of child rape. Whatever the hell that means. That means he's that... In prison. He's in prison because he's weird and unpopular, no. and he has a different <laughs> lifestyle that other people find creepy. No, he's an accessory to the rape of children. That is a felony and a serious one at that. What do you mean an accessory? He's like got some weird religious cult where he thinks it's okay to, you know, marry underage girls, but he didn't do it. Why wouldn't the guy who actually did it, who had sex with an underage girl, he should be the one who's doing life. The the, The rapist in this case has made a lifelong commitment to live and take care of the person. So it is a little different. I mean, let's just be honest about it. Now, I mean, I'm just a... Just a humble cable news host trying to get my arms around this. Um, a few things there. Mary there, I mean, Jess did marry them. Not, not in the he married them as in they married him, but he married them, like as in like a transitive verb, right? And the argument here is that Jeffs is just a religious weirdo being targeted for his different beliefs, which include child brides, like a 14-year-old, and also the rapist pledged to take care of the 14-year-old, so that's fine. And that Jeff should not be in jail for facilitating the incestuous marriage of a 14-year-old, which, again... That's a view you can have. I think it's really weird and unnerving. Just me. In a way, Tucker got his wish. In 2010, Jeff's conviction was actually overturned. So, huh. He was ahead of the curve there. Oh, but then, unfortunately, one year later, he was sentenced to life in prison after a jury found him guilty of raping a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old. Hmm. So... 
I think people are rightly concerned about the prospect of legislation that would legalize child marriage, particularly child brides. I think that's probably what would happen. You would think that being such a great defender of children that Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee, of all people, after that big star turn in those hearings, you know, in the very state where this is being proposed, would be losing her mind about this bill when it's so glaring and obvious. I mean, given, of course, the way she lost her mind during those Judge Jackson hearings. But as far as we can tell, not a peep, not one word, not one thing in public. We actually reached out to her office today to get her thoughts on the prospective bill and what she thinks about child marriage. We haven't heard back. Weird, you'd take an opportunity to hit that softball, don't you think? But other people have been reporting about what is happening in Tennessee. In fact, it's generated some pretty negative headlines for obvious reasons. I mean, the child bride bill doesn't sound great, does it? So just today, two weeks after the Tennessee Republicans admitted the bill had no explicit age requirements, they passed an amendment to the bill that would require both parties to be 18 or older before getting married. Well, good. Took a little bit of work, huh? Even though its sponsor, that guy Tom Leatherwood, seems to think the amendment wasn't really necessary. My position that bill never would have allowed um, minors to be able to get married because contracts so forth, but I can see and understand how that might have been misunderstood. Again, round of applause. Be clear. It's a good thing. It's good Tennessee Republicans are not legalizing child marriage. It's bad that it basically took weeks of public outcry for them to do something about it. Again, the very party that claims to be very concerned with protecting children right now that's accusing their enemies of being literal pedophiles wrote a bill that apparently would have allowed children to get married and then they got caught and after public scrutiny and backlash, they reassessed and changed the language of the bill. No thanks to Marsha Blackburn. It is Thursday, the 7th of April of 2022. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Oh, yeah. Hey, um, that uh, clip at the top there I, I with Chris Hayes, I just got to say, I, I really have a hard time taking uh, arguments about family values from a hot yoga sex Nazi <laughs> who, I don't know, is, is that an open marriage? I'm trying to figure out what that is, okay? I really don't want to talk about family values with someone like that. Now, I'm not condemning that particular kind of lifestyle. I mean, there's a lot of really nice uh, hot yoga sex Nazis in open marriages, apparently. And uh, I guess they make good carrot cake. Maybe, maybe they do. But it's not enough for me have to, to have to take lessons about family values and what's sick. <laughs> Come on, give me a break. Yeah, I mean, she's... And, and, it's not only the hot yoga sex guru that she, you know, had a little bit of, you know, humpa, humpa, humpa with, but her gym uh, coach also, or weightlifting coach. I don't want to, I really don't want to see that uh, vision in my head of MTG getting bonked in a gym, in a weight room. I can just, I don't even want to imagine it. I can I really don't want to. Because why why then is she allowed to stand in the well of Congress and heckle Jamie Raskin? Apparently, with uh, no punishment, I guess Nancy's punished her I, enough. What can they do? Take away another committee assignment? She doesn't have any. Write a sternly worded letter. Stop doing that. Well, at least our good old friend Jamie Raskin, he knows his way around, uh, you know, uh, Marcus Queensberry of uh, rules of, I don't know, punching the Nazis. <laughs> yeah, he got her tirade in the congressional record. And if this thing, yeah, I know, I'm dehumanizing her on purpose. Um, 
If she had taken a civvies class, she would probably know the import of what Raskin did when he pretty much, pretty much, he did put her tirade into the congressional record in which he mentioned the term an axis of Putin and Trump and she and the Republican Party are part of it. Thank you very much. Posterity will now remember. Okay. So, um, Donnie is blaming, Donnie is blaming Nancy for what happened on January 6th. Well, she should have called the Capitol. She should have called the National Guard. No, you should have. Your job is to do that, not hers. But once again, these Nazis care nothing about norms. They don't even know what the norms are, or they purport to not know it. With Trump, he never cared, so he wouldn't have known. And that's some sort of defense now. Oh, well, he, he was just he was just ignorant of it. Yeah, you know, I, for our whole lives, didn't we hear the term over and over and over that ignorance is no excuse in the law? Whether you know that you broke the law or not, if you broke the law, you broke the law. You can't use the defense of, oh, I didn't know that, you know, hitting somebody over the head with an axe was illegal. Oh, okay, well, you since you didn't know that using an axe to hit someone over the head was illegal, we'll just have to let you go? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Magna Carta this, huh? Jeez. So every norm has no meaning. It's purposeful. It's what a Nazi does. So when I use the term Nazi, I'm not stripping it of its meaning like Vladimir Putin has done, where Nazi is just a pejorative against whoever your perceived enemy is, sort of like Marjorie Taylor Greene calling Democrats pedophiles. Yeah, well, you're a hot sex yoga swinger, biatch. Jeez. I'd say wife swapper, but people might get the wrong idea. There's no wife swapping here. Husband swapping, maybe. And the uh, other ladies don't get to take part. So, you know, as far as we know. <sighs> and they complain about our sexual deviancy. Jeez. Whatever that is. <laughs> and do we really care? Should we care? Only when it's used as a cudgel by hypocrites. I don't know. Maybe since there's not as much of an uproar about Marjorie Taylor Greene's hot sex yoga sex. I'm sorry, hot yoga sex, not hot sex yoga. Hot yoga sex in the tantric kind, too. Oh, let that serpent rise. Um, I, may, maybe there's a lot of people on our side who have been taking part in all that hot yoga sex. Kundalini style. Let that serpent rise. Um, so, so maybe there's not so much of an uproar because, you know, what? people do on their own time is their business ultimately it doesn't matter one whit what they're doing and they shouldn't care what we're doing as long as long as it's not hurting people and we know how they project so when they call them our they call us the party of pedophiles we know what they're really saying and um now I'm not let, let, let's not you know split hairs here. This this thing of abusing kids ha knows no party affiliation. But it does seem there's one party who's trying to make an excuse for it by blaming the other side of taking part in it like they're I don't know, angels in white. Which is probably how they view themselves because that's really hot yoga sex. Ooh. Okay, that's what happens when you mix culture. You get this sort of weird southern bell 
plantation idea of the Southern Belle in her, I don't know, wedding dress and hot yoga sex. Let that serpent rise. It is powerful. Yeah, it is. Okay. Of course, you know, in tantric yoga, there's no, uh, I don't know, release from your frustrations, shall we say. You're supposed to recycle it. Let that serpent rise. Okay. That's what happens when we interpret what, yeah, kundalini and tantric yoga is. Eh, We sort of turn it around to our own predilections, don't we? I don't know. Maybe they want to dress it up in a schoolgirl uniform. Maybe that's what they do. Apparently, they had to rewrite that law in Tennessee because, oh my God, there's no wage limits. Oh, geez, they caught us. I love the guy's excuse, you know. There's a lot of preachers here in the state that, you know, uh, don't really think that there should be any a minimum age limit to marry off their girly girls. Because, uh, you know, the the pickings are slim now. Everybody wants to move out to the sinful city. <laughs> sinful city? Yeah, to get away from your eeky sex stuff. You're going to pray, Dada, and you're going to pray well. Oh, my God. <laughs> the sinful city. Yeah, I don't know. Nice dinners, the ballet. <laughs> An occasional theater uh, outing every now and then when you could. Great movies, sports. Yeah, the sinful city. It's only sinful because they're, you know, they recognize that there's a lot of people running away from the sin that we perpetuate here. And we're supposed to be the pure folk that everyone should be uh, heeding our word over. Okay. That's why hot sex yoga Nazis like Marjorie Taylor Greene are able to get away with it. Mm hmm. All right. Well, enough of that. (laughs) What is on the rest of the curated show here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy as we as we begin this fabulous, fabulous Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays in a five to four shadow docket decision. The Supreme Court reinstated the Trump rule that gutted the Clean Water Act of 1972. Oh, thank you. And apparently uh, Roberts, uh, the balls and strikes guy, wasn't very pleased with uh, his conservative brethren about judicial overreach. Uh, Apparently, Joe Biden signed a sweeping overhaul of the U.S. Postal Service that saved six days a week mail delivery. But Louis DeJoy is still there to monkey wrench the works. And House Democrats accused oil companies of price gouging as Americans suffer from ever-increasing gasoline prices during the war in Ukraine. And of course, the oil companies are blaming Antifa. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where the UN General Assembly is voting today for Russia to be stripped of its seat on the 47-member Human Rights Council. Yeah, we'll take them off the Security Council. I don't know if we can do that, but I'd like to see it tried. And Russia said that it made a debt payment in rubles this week, a move that could put the country on a path to an historic default. And we can only hope. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com to the right of the page, right there by the social media scroll, is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored 
by Kelly Lincoln, who will be in Pittsburgh this year for what? For Netroots Nation, yes. The first in-person Netroots Nation in two years, and you know why. So uh, we're looking forward to that. So do stay tuned uh, for Kelly Lincoln bringing you content from Netroots Nation live and uh, recorded, because that's how we do it here at Netroots Radio. If you would look across the page uh, from that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will then hopefully notice the Patreon link. And yeah, that's there because why? We're not a media empire, and apparently all that Soros money they say that we're supposed to be getting paid never gets paid. And we don't expect it because it doesn't exist. Okay? We like to make jokes about it. But uh, regardless, we're not in it for the money. We're in it because there are dark forces trying, trying. (laughs) There are dark forces arrayed against not only the United States of America, but representative democracy and all that represents around the world. And we, we, we can't stand for that. And we won't. And with your help, we're able to be well, whatever a bulwark we are uh, against those dark forces. And if you could afford an espresso-type coffee drink, and if you could afford to send those funds our way once a month, and I know everything, costs of everything has gone up. That's why we make these appeals. Our bills keep going up. And if you could afford to send those funds our way once a month, it really does help us pay our bills. And... Uh, Yeah, we'll worry about the machinery. Oh, I should mention really quick. Thank you, Tom, for uh, helping get the uh, MacBook cleaned up enough so that we can uh, continue using it. It was getting gummed up, and I wasn't able to sync files, which is very important trying to get those files into the broadcaster because they have to be synced first. Okay, but nonetheless, uh, we'll worry about machinery, paying our bills is help that we need on a consistent basis, I got to tell you. And we thank you for your generosity. And there have been some who have been generous for many, many years. And uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, your loyalty. It's very, it is heartfelt. And that's another reason why we continue. Because, um, well, I don't know if we're doing God's work, but it is important to save representative democracy in any way we can. I'm not able to, you know, run down the street and throttle a Nazi. So I throttle him in the way that I am able to. And thank you for letting us fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended. Oh, so many years ago. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so at Netroots Radio, and Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. Once again, thank you. Wow. Yeah, sometimes on tech stuff, I I can figure it out, but I need to have my hand held occasionally. and, And thank you, Tom, for holding my hand. If you would like to follow the show... On Twitter, do so at Cookbook West. And, oh, oh, I should mention, follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam because I post the show notes and Link's Diary on Daily Codes about 10 minutes before showtime. And then I get that posted up, maybe, <laughs> on Twitter before the show. But certainly while the show is going on, I can push a button every now and then. And there it goes. So, uh, yes, the show notes and links are where the real reportage is because we go off here. Can you tell? Okay, follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. And of course, as you know, the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library, including West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, over 11 years of Netroots Radio, can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Now save some room because we have the amuse-bouche. I know they're just a little kiss, but they're filling. And that will be coming up in the chef's table later on. We do everything backwards here in America, so 
Usually the amuse bouche is before. We do it after. You know, because we have the salad before instead of after. All right? Just so you know. We like to change it up because we're exceptional, aren't we? Jessica Gresco of the Associated Press brings us this first offering in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Supreme Court yesterday reinstated, for now, a Trump-era rule that curtails the power of states and Native American tribes to to block pipelines and other energy projects that can pollute rivers, streams, and other waterways. Yeah, the Native Americans don't have any religious rights, you know. Their firmly held beliefs mean nothing. In a decision that split the court five to four, the justices agreed to halt a lower court judge's order throwing out the rule. Now, the high court's action does not interfere with the Biden administration's plan to rewrite the rule. Work on a revision has begun, but the administration has said a final rule is not expected until the spring of 2023. And that's a lot of time to pollute these waters. Hey, let's just dump all this dioxin into the Niagara. Okay. The Trump era rule will remain in effect in the meantime. Hey, we got some polonium uh, here left over from when Vlad visited. Where should we put it? Ah, we don't care. The court's three liberal justices and Chief Justice John Roberts descended. The court's other conservative justices, including three packed by Donald Trump, voted to reinstate the rule. You know, I kind of add a little bit of flavor. <sighs> But Trump did pack the court with the help of Mitch McConnell. And th- and actually, Mitch McConnell's been packing this court for, you know, a decade to, you know. Writing for the dissenters, Justice Elena Kagan said the group of states and industry associations that had asked for the lower court's ruling to be put on hold had not shown the extraordinary circumstances necessary to grant that request. Kagan said the group had failed to demonstrate their harm if the judge's decision were left in place. She said the group had not identified a single project that a state has obstructed in the months since the judge's decision and had twice delayed making a request indicating it was not urgent. Why do they need urgency? Because it's on the shadow docket. Kagan said the court's majority had gone astray in granting the emergency petition. Emergency petition in a shadow docket. Okay. Now, we all know what that means. No debate. Uh Uh-huh. Pretty much in secret. All right. That process is sometimes called the court shadow docket. Really? Because the court provides a decision quickly without the full briefing and argument. The liberal justices have recently been critical of its use. Recently? As is typical, the justices in the majority did not not explain their reasoning. You know, they accuse... They accuse the new Supreme Court nominee of being evasive. Because I guess she wasn't evasive enough. The Biden administration had told the justices in a court filing that it agreed that the U.S. District Court Judge William Alsup lacked the authority to throw out the rule without first determining that it was invalid. But the administration had urged the court not to reinstate the rule, saying that in the months since Alsup's ruling, officials have adapted to the change, reverting to regulations in place for decades. Another change would cause substantial disruption and disservice of the public interest, the administration said. EPA spokesman Tim Carroll said in an email that the agency is reviewing the Supreme Court's order as well as moving forward with rulemaking to restore state and tribal authority to protect water resources that are essential to public health, ecosystems, and economic opportunity. You know, since everybody wants to put their uh, uh, coal tailings and nuclear spent material in reservation waterways. 
maybe maybe that constituency should have a say about what's going on. Leroy Coleman, a spokesman for the National Hydropower Association, one of the groups that had sought to halt the lower court judge's order, said in a statement that the court's decision will ensure that the Biden administration properly considers this important rule as it considers changes promulgated by the EPA less than two years ago. Now, the section of the federal law at issue in the case is Section 401 of the Clean Water Act. You know, the Clean Water Act of 1972. For decades, it has been the rule that a federal agency could not issue a license or permit to conduct any activity that could result in any discharge into navigable waters unless the affected state or tribe certified that the discharge complied with the Clean Water Act and state law or waived certification. The Trump administration in 2020 curtailed that review power after complaints from Republicans in Congress and the fossil fuel industry that state officials had used the permitting process to stop new energy projects. Well, no shit, Sherlock. The Trump administration said its actions would advance then-President Donald Trump's goal to fast-track energy projects such as oil and natural gas pipelines because that way he could skim more off the top. States, Native American tribes, and environmental groups sued. Several mostly Republican-led states, a national trade association representing the oil and gas industry, and others have intervened in the case to defend the Trump-era rule. The states involved in the case are Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, West Virginia, Wyoming, and Texas. Associated Press bring us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. A sweeping overhaul of the U.S. Postal Service meant to shore up the popular but beleaguered agency's financial future and cement six days a week mail delivery was signed into law yesterday, Wednesday, by President Joe Biden. The legislation cleared Congress last month after a after fully a dozen years of discussion that took on a new sense of urgency amid widespread complaints about mail service delays. I think we should call those de joys. Officials had repeatedly warned that without congressional action, the Postal Service would be out of cash by 2024. The Postal Service is central to our economy and essential to rural America, Biden said. He added that male men and women deliver 4 million prescriptions per day, along with letters, consumer goods, and even live animals, often to parts of the country that private carriers can't or won't or are not required to reach. The final legislation achieved rare bipartisan support, by scrapping some of the more controversial proposals and settling on core ways to save the service. Delivering the mail is among the most popular things the government does, with 91% of Americans having a favorable opinion of the Postal Service. The bill signing came the same day the Postal Service announced its plan to raise rates, effective on July 10th. Under the proposal submitted by the Postal Regulatory Commission, the cost of a first-class forever stamp would increase by $0.02 to $0.60. 
The Postal Service said the increase, which is less than the, than the annual rate of inflation, will help the agency implement Postmaster General Louis DeJoy's 10-year plan to stabilize agency finances. It sounds to me like he's monkey-wrenching. You know, gumming up the works. He's sabotaging the machinery. Lawmakers from both parties attended the signing ceremony, and the mood was jovial. A big improvement from Kansas Republican Senator Jerry Moran previously saying the service was in a death spiral that was particularly hard on rural Americans. Well, that's because of Trump and DeJoy. Criticism of the Postal Service peaked in 2020 amid the COVID-19 crisis and ahead of the presidential election, as cutbacks delayed service at a time when millions of Americans were relying on mail-in ballots during the pandemic. Trump acknowledged he was trying to financially pinch the service to limit its processing ability for an expected surge of mail-in ballots, which he worried would cost him the election he eventually lost. Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. House Democrats accused oil companies of ripping off the American people and putting profits before production as Americans suffer from ever-increasing gasoline prices during the war in Ukraine, which in this reporter's opinion is a nice way of saying they're price gouging. At a time of record profits, big oil is refusing to increase production to provide the American people some needed relief at the gas pump, said Representative Frank Pallone, chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Oil executives testifying before Congress for the second time in six months responded that oil is a global market and that oil companies don't dictate prices. We do not control the market price of crude or natural gas, nor of refined products like gasoline and diesel. We have no tolerance for price gouging, said Chevron CEO Michael Wirth with a straight face. Facing sharp criticisms from Democrats, Worth, ExxonMobil CEO Darren Woods, and other executives said their companies have no plans to halt payments of dividends to stockholders or to restrict stock buybacks that have enriched shareholders and company executives. The six companies at the hearing recorded $77 billion in profit last year, they testified. Well, that brings us to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. When you look up at the Milky Way, you're gazing at the galactic equivalent of Rome, a metropolis of stars with layers upon layers of history just like the Eternal City, so says the astronomer Hans-Walter Ricks. There were glory days, there were disasters, 
And all of these things kind of happen in the life of galaxies. And the Milky Way is just one galaxy. We can look at star by star. And so you can kind of see individual episodes in, in actual detail. Now Rix and a colleague at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Germany have indeed gone star by star, determining the ages of nearly a quarter million stars in the Milky Way. That work has allowed them to reconstruct some of the major life events in the galaxy's evolution over its 13 billion years of existence. What it showed is that indeed the youth and childhood of the Milky Way was turbulent, but actually afterwards we've lived an enormously sheltered life compared to most other galaxies. Gas drizzled in, and the suburbs grew peacefully and sprawled. The astronomers say that the galaxy's thick disk began to form around 13 billion years ago, just 800 million years after the Big Bang. Then, around 11 billion years ago, a cataclysmic collision occurred. The Gaia Enceladus satellite galaxy crashed into the Milky Way. And just at the same time, there was a huge burst of star formation or a large increase of star formation in our own Milky Way. And that suggests, doesn't prove, that the perturbance that this infalling satellite created caused a lot of the gas that was in our Milky Way to form stars. The details are in the journal Nature. Now, none of this is a total surprise. People have simulated the Milky Way's formation before. So I would say really what our work has done is it just shows it clearly a long suspected picture is coming into focus. In other words, this work lays out a more definitive playbill of the acts in this galactic drama. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Good eating habits developed in childhood can last a lifetime, but getting children to eat their fruits and vegetables is a common problem. Eating them adds important nutrients, helps control weight, and reduces the risks for many serious illnesses. Children in the U.S. are eating more fruit. However, 60% of children get fewer fruits than recommended, and 93% don't get enough vegetables. Child care schools and school districts can help change this by meeting or exceeding federal nutrition standards for meals and snacks, including fruits and vegetables wherever food is offered, and helping children learn about and taste fruits and vegetables. At home, parents can eat a variety of fruits and vegetables with their children and provide them as snacks, even if it takes many tries. Also, parents can include their children when shopping for, growing, and preparing fruits and vegetables. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. It doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. Netrootsradio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. In 2022, does censorship work? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. On Russian state-controlled television, facts about Putin's invasion of Ukraine have been replaced with a relentless barrage of propaganda, endless hours of repeating that Nazis run Ukraine, and Russia needed to invade that country to save itself. Under a new law, any journalist or media outlet that asserts anything to the contrary faces 15 years in prison with the result that in Russia, opposition to the war has been silenced. Over 80 percent of Russians, according to recent polling, support both the war and Putin. So, from Putin's point of view, his totalitarian censorship is working well. But dictators are not the only ones who utilize censorship. 
Some elected officials in the United States today are using an American milder version of this theme. Recently, some states have enacted laws that, in broad strokes, prohibit the teaching or discussion in public schools of material that may be deemed critical of some of the history of the United States, such as the slave trade, slavery, Jim Crow, segregation, racial violence, and lynchings, what we used to call facts and history. Recent events have made plain that we should condemn and fight censorship anywhere and everywhere, any time it rears its ugly head, in whatever form. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Their slogan was justice for janitors. Their chant was si se puede, yes we can. Their image was a red and black poster of a mop raised high in a clenched fist. 3,000 members of SEIU Local 1877 marched in the streets of downtown Los Angeles. Many of the marchers were Latina women. Some had their children with them. On this day in labor history, the year was 2000. The massive protest marked the third day of their strike for a better life. The janitors were some of the poorest paid workers in Los Angeles. Their average wage was only $6.70 an hour. This was well below the janitorial wage of most other major cities in the U.S., Picketing workers targeted downtown office buildings. 18 contractors oversaw the janitorial services in these buildings. The workers demanded $1 an hour wage increase for three years. The contractors refused to negotiate. Several prominent politicians and religious leaders supported the strike. Finally, after three weeks, the strike was settled. The union won a 25% wage increase over three years. Although it was a sizable victory, it fell short of the hoped goal for $3 an hour. Jose Chayas, a shop steward and member of the negotiating committee, explained, Even as united as we were, every nickel was difficult. The fight in Los Angeles was just one battle in the long justice for janitors struggle. Since 1985, SEIU has been working on the janitors campaign, which includes nearly a quarter of a million workers. In the next two years, 130,000 janitors in 33 cities across the nation will negotiate their contracts. Very likely, this will include janitors in a city near you. Will you support their fight for justice? Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryintwo.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the West Coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 46 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of 86. What? But don't worry, we're going to be much cooler tomorrow. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, Sunny to partly cloudy today. Winds will be light and variable. Mostly cloudy overnight with lows in the upper 40s. And cloudy skies early tomorrow, becoming partly cloudy later in the day. Highs in the low 60s. (laughs) Isn't that nice? And it looks like, oh, and winds will be out of the winds. We'll be out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And we have a forecast of rain beginning tomorrow night. And then Saturday through most of next week, we have a forecast of, wait for it, rain and snow. Okay. Grass pollen is rated as low right outside the window in Rogue River proper. The air quality index is good at... Uh, 25 parts per million, which means people are going to burn their trash piles because they're allowed to do that here. And the daytime UV uh, 
UV index is moderate at level 5. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.24 inches. Visibility is at 9 miles. And relative humidity is at 85%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 56 and partly cloudy with heavy wind. Paris is 59 degrees and partly cloudy with wind. Rome is 64 degrees and partly cloudy with wind. I guess there's pretty windy over there. Kiev is 67 and fair. Kabul is 65 and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 72 and fair. Tokyo is 55 degrees and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 68 and cloudy. San Francisco, California is 60 degrees and fair. And New York, New York is 48 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. M. Letterer of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The UN General Assembly is voting today on a U.S. initiated resolution to suspend Russia from the World Organization's leading human rights body over allegations that Russian soldiers killed civilians while retreating from the region around Ukraine's capital. U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield made the call for Russia to be stripped of its seat on the 47-member Human Rights Council in the wake of videos and photos of streets in the town of Buka strewn with corpses of what appeared to be civilians. The deaths have sparked global revulsion and calls for tougher sanctions on Russia, which has vehemently decided denied his troops were responsible. General Assembly spokeswoman Paulina Kubiak said the Assembly's emergency special session on Ukraine would resume today when the resolution to suspend the rights of membership in the Human Rights Council of the Russian Federation will be put to a vote. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Ken Sweet of the AP brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Russia said yesterday Wednesday that it made a debt payment in rubles this week, a move that may not be accepted by Russia's foreign debt holders and could put the country on a path to an historic default. The Ministry of Finance said in a statement that it tried to make a $649 million payment toward two bonds to an unnamed U.S. bank, previously reported as J.P. Morgan Chase, but that payment was not accepted because new U.S. sanctions prohibit Russia from using U.S. banks to pay its debts. 
Russia said it has instead transferred the funds in rubles into a special account with Russia's National Settlement Depository, the country's securities regulator. The ministry added that once a country is allowed to access foreign exchange markets, not something that will happen in the foreseeable future due to sanctions, it will decide whether to allow bondholders to convert the ruble payment back into dollars or euros. Uh Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des tiers. Des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver